good evening. Welcome back to this uh, virtual study that we've been doing. Uh, as a reminder, here at Monument Heights, we are closed to all in-person church activities through January 23rd. Uh, we hope that things will improve and we'll be able to get back uh, to worship first and foremost and then to our other activities as well. But with that said, we'll be continuing our study uh, that we began last week, and that's on this Ark of Scripture. Uh, so you can see here the title, The Ark of Scripture. And we'll just do a quick little review before we jump into some of the new details. And, and by the way, we'll be spending roughly five total videos on this. So if you missed it, last week kind of gives an introduction. This week, we'll be looking at the early history of Israel, specifically continuing our conversation about the covenant with Abraham that we saw last week. Next week, we'll look at the dynasty, the kingdom of Israel, some of the key players in Saul and David and even Solomon. And then in the fourth week, we'll look at what the prophets are doing in the Old Testament. Um, and then toward the fifth week, we'll look at some fulfillment passages and how this all comes together uh, as one grand story, the arc of Scripture from Eden to the city of God in Revelation to the new heavens and the new earth. Um, and then at some point, we'll probably try to do some practice. We may wait until we're back in person and on Wednesday nights do some guided or directed practice of reading Scripture along the lines of what we've discovered here. Uh, but for now, let's let's talk about what we discussed last week. I suggested, and again, I'm relying heavily on this work um, by Graham Goldsworthy. Let me just pull this down so you can see it a little bigger here. Um, specifically, this top one called The Gospel and Kingdom. So this you can buy as the Goldsworthy Trilogy, uh, three books in one. All are wonderful, but I was deeply influenced a number of years ago um, by the Goldsworthy uh, way of thinking about these things, but but deeply influenced by gospel and kingdom. And the great thing about it is it's not an academic book. It really is written for the layperson. Uh, so it's a good entry point, I'm not saying it'll be super easy reading, uh, but it's also not overly technical. There are a number of other technical books, but all of this gets us into this great field of what is known as biblical theology, um, which is kind of a specific way of looking at Scripture and trying to discern its theological message. Um, and one of the unifying messages or one of the unifying themes that we find in Scripture is this idea of the kingdom of God. And this is really Goldsworthy's case, and I think it's a helpful theme to help us think about the arc of Scripture. In the kingdom of God, we talked about the ingredients that make up the kingdom of God. Um, and we said there are three things. We first said that there is um, God's people on, and they're in God's place and they're under God's rule. Um, so we talked about God's special people being in God's prepared place and being under God's jurisdiction or rule and in a unique relationship with him. And we talked about where we see that. And we see that in Eden, for example. We have Adam and Eve, God's people made in his image, and they are in the garden, his place. He declares it very good after he looks at it. And they are under God's rule, even a spoken rule, you shall eat from any tree in the garden, except this one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat from, lest you die. We see it in Revelation as well as we go to the final chapters of Revelation, particularly Revelation 21, and we see the new heavens and the new earth coming down, and that new heaven and new earth um, is made up of God's people. We read in Revelation 21, those opening verses, and God will dwell with them forever, and there'll be this new way of doing things because God will be present there. So again, people, place, and rule. All of that is a way of seeing Scripture uh, as just this big unified theme. And we can even think about Scripture then as giving us this notion of history 
um, with a purpose. And as Christians, we can think about the Old Testament that way. In the Old Testament, we're not just talking about pure history, but we're talking about theological history, history with a purpose, history that speaks of God's redemptive activity in Christ. Uh, Goldsworthy has this great quote. Uh, here's the arc we talked about last week. But Goldsworthy has this great quote. He says, the unique feature of Israel's history was that its purpose involved both revelation of salvation and the way of salvation. Since God is Lord and since salvation has reference to the bringing of sinners into the kingdom of God, that same kingdom will be reflected in the history, which is salvation history. So this whole culminating redemptive action of God in Christ. Uh, because he is Lord of history, he is orchestrating history. And that orchestration of history is this notion of bringing sinners into his kingdom, bringing people who were once not his people to be his people. So God's people in God's place under God's rule. And we can really put that grid over all of scripture. But this evening, what I want to do is I want to think about the Old Testament story, especially the early books of Genesis and Exodus, and really to some extent, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy are included. And we'll go up through Judges, uh, but we'll spend the majority of our time just sketching out Genesis and Exodus, not really the books themselves, but in light of this redemptive story and what's going on there. So think for a second about Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, you have the fall of mankind or humankind. The serpent tempts Adam and Eve, and they fail the temptation. They are in, brought into the rebellion that characterizes the serpent, and they rebel against the Lord. Um, the, the idea is that they will know right uh, they, they will know right and wrong, or not right and wrong, they, they will be able to determine for themselves what is right and wrong. It's this expression of independence from the Lord of the universe. And, and so they do that. They, they rebel. And, and then what happens next? Think for a second. Just see if you can fix it in your head. What? After Genesis 3, they're expelled from the garden. And then what's the next thing we come to? So if you're you're tracking, the next thing we come to is the story of two brothers that are the children of Adam and Eve, and their names are Cain and Abel. Now, it's really interesting. We have to read the Bible as a story, and it's significant that this is the next thing we get, because what we see is the results of the fall of mankind starting to play out. And so in Genesis 4, we have these two brothers, and one of them, uh, Cain, kills the other. Cain kills Abel. And of course, we know that one of the next big things after that is the flood, and that starts in Genesis 6. But before we get there, in the rest of Genesis 4 and in the entirety of Genesis 5, we have this long list of names, what we call genealogies. And these things are often um, difficult for people uh, when they're reading the Bible or when they're trying to get oriented or introduced to the Bible, they find these things difficult and your eyes almost glaze over. Why in the world do we have list of names in the Bible? But they're really significant and we just kind of have to learn to pay attention to why they're significant. There's a reason they are there. And the reason these particular lists in Genesis 4 and 5 are there is that they're setting out two different lines, two different lineage, lineages. So Cain kills his brother Abel, but God replaces Abel with Seth. The Lord provides another child for, uh, for Adam and Eve, and his name is Seth. And so in chapter 4, we have Cain's descendants, and in chapter 5, we have Seth's. And this is how it plays out. This is a great chart uh, from Goldsworthy. Uh, so you can see here we have Adam and then the three children, Cain, Abel, and Seth. And in Genesis 4, we have Cain's line that goes to uh, Lamech and then ends. And after that, we'll see the flood. But in Seth's line in Genesis 5, we have a whole different story. So first, let's we'll come back to this, but first, let's look at how Cain's line plays out. So Lane kill, or Cain killed his brother, Abel. And then Cain has this descendant, um, this great, great 
uh, great grandson. I may I may have the number of greats wrong there, but but you get the point. This distant descendant, and it seems to be increasing the severity of what Cain has already done. So Cain did something horrible. He killed his brother. But then we come to Genesis 4, beginning in verse 19, and we read about this descendant of his, this great, great, great grandson, Lamech. And Lamech took two wives, right? There's kind of a red flag, probably. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. And then here's the, the significant part Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me a young man for striking me. So we see the perpetuation of what Cain has already done. Cain killed his brother, uh, Abel, and now this descendant has too engaged in a killing. And he has done so because of what appears to be, um, he was wounded, but in all likelihood, what we have here is an excessive response to a perceived problem. So Lamech overcompensates, right? He kills this man for wounding him. It's not an eye for an eye. It's not, it's not at all just, it is an elevation or an overcompensation for what's happened. And what's even more striking is the parallel line here, a young man for striking me. The typical use of this Hebrew word is not an adult male, but is indeed something like a teenager. So it's quite possible that the real point of this is that Lamech has increased Cain's original transgression to a huge degree because not only has he perpetuated the violence that is in his family line, but he has gone even further by killing a young man who would presumably not even be able to defend himself. And so that's kind of the story of Cain's line. Um, we come to the end of the line and we have Lamech and, and, and he's celebrating it. Look, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77 fold. So he's looking for an out. He's saying, this doesn't, this doesn't, uh, I, I shouldn't be punished for this. So there's almost this sense of celebration. So Cain did it, and he was somewhat remorseful, but now we see that the cycle has perpetuated, and it's even worse. There's no remorse whatsoever. In fact, there may be celebration. And then, after that, there's a second lineage mentioned. So that's Cain, all the way down to Lamech. But then we get this mention in the next two verses of another line. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed, which is the word uh, from which Seth is derived, for me, another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And so there's our verse 25, and we can see here this line that comes down, uh, this line that comes down from Seth goes to Enoch, and then notice who's there, Noah. Well, that's who the most important uh, immediate descendant of Seth is. Of course, ultimately we'll see, and it's, it's a little bit obscured, I think, by the picture here. But Noah, of course, gives birth to three sons, and out of Shem comes Abraham. Um, and it's, it's ten generations from Noah. So we have Noah, and Noah is unique. Noah, his name means something like rest or relief, and it's through Noah that God is going to bring relief or rest to his creation. See, Seth's family strives to repair the disrupted relationship between humankind and God. All of chapter 5 is devoted to this line from Seth. And Noah is significant because in a world where evil is only growing worse, right, where, where Cain's descendants are celebrating the killing of young men, where, where he has these multiple wives, right? Where men are murdering and celebrating those murders, God will use Noah to bring relief. And, and right here, we start to understand that the flood, while it is judgment, while it is severe, 
is also part of God's grace to a world that has seemingly gone off the rails. Now, we won't talk about the flood. That's really a topic for another time. But what we do need to talk about is Abraham again. And I introduced you to the Abrahamic covenant. So Abraham descends from this godly line of Seth and Noah. Uh, But let's talk about the covenant of Abraham. And I've emphasized this a lot, but the covenant with Abraham is uh, really taking up the bulk of the whole story of Genesis, really takes up the whole of the Old Testament's critical to understanding the Bible. Um, But a great deal of discussion around this covenant is from Genesis 12 to 24. It really dominates it and appears over and over again throughout um, that section and then again throughout Scripture. The initial covenant with Abraham is, of course, as I pointed out last week in Genesis 12. And here are the promises. There's three of them. Abraham's descendants would become a great nation. And all of these references, by the way, are to Genesis. So Abraham's descendants would become a great nation. We see that in the following passages in Genesis. Number two, they would possess the promised land. So people and place. And again, all of these references are in Genesis. And then they would be God's people. Again, references in Genesis as the covenant is explained. So people, place, and special relationship with God under God's rule. And there's an additional component here. The promise always included, always included an extension beyond blood descendants. So this wasn't just for Israel, the nation. It never was intended for that. The the idea that we see in the New Testament of God extending his reach to all peoples is not like plan B or something like that. This was God's plan from the very beginning. And that's really important for understanding the sweeping story of scripture. So really what Genesis is about, as we think about the kind of the story here, Genesis is as a whole about God's enduring faithfulness, his continued faithfulness in spite of human failure. So Abraham fails plenty, right? We have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah with Abraham's nephew, Lot. Um, We have Abraham multiple times right, um, getting rid of his wife or or lying about his relationship to his wife, not trusting God. Um, We have... um, the the uh, stories where uh, Esau is tricked right by by Jacob and um, then uh, Isaac uh, is wrestling with with this with God right and is renamed Israel um, and so you have all of this um, I feel like I might have just said something wrong if I got those names mixed up uh, forgive me uh, it's it's trying to keep it all straight um, it, it's just a a slip of my tongue. Um, so, so we have this, this continued failure, right? And, and all that culminates in this lengthy story toward the end of Genesis. Um, and there's a bunch in between, but there's this lengthy story at the end of Genesis about Joseph. And we know that Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery and, and all of this. But the key verse for the book of Genesis comes out of Joseph's mouth in Genesis 50. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So in spite of human failure, in spite of human wickedness, in spite of what Cain did, in spite of what Lamech did, what we see in Genesis again and again and again is God's continued faithfulness and specifically his continued faithfulness to his promise to Abraham that he will bless every nation in the world through Abraham and that he's bringing his kingdom, God's people, God's place, and God's rule in a special relationship with God to this world. So that really helps us grasp Genesis. Now, where are the Israelites when Genesis comes to a close? Um, They end up in Egypt and they end up there because Joseph is Abraham's great grandson and Israel is in Egypt and we see there in the opening chapters that the covenant promises are at stake because they're in a foreign land and they find themselves under a wicked king. Now the question naturally arises why would God do this? Why why is this the way the story's 
unfolding. But let's discuss the opening chapters of Exodus. As I've said, we're introduced to this new king who doesn't know Joseph and who is very harsh and cruel to the Israelites. Um, and this this uh, new king, this new Pharaoh, is an anti-God figure. He's really set up as an opponent of God, as a, almost like a Satan figure. And what's really fascinating here is that the concept of kingdoms is at play. The Israelites are under the jurisdiction of Pharaoh's kingdom. Right? The people of God are now the people of Pharaoh, not in their place, but in a foreign land in Egypt, and they're under the rule of Pharaoh. So God determines to deliver them, but on what basis does he determine to deliver them? And it's on this basis right here, his faithfulness to the covenant with Abraham. Just notice in the opening chapters of the Exodus, some of these passages. And God heard their groaning and God remembered. Not that he had forgotten it, right? This is a way of saying that it's on this basis that God is acting. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So it's on the basis of this covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And there you go. I did misspeak earlier. Um, I, I had the, the order um, wrong. Jacob is the one who, of course, becomes Israel. Um, and now I'm not even sure if I did have the order wrong. So if I said it wrong, here's, here's clarification. Um, again, in chapter three, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, and I've underlined that part because that's the original covenant. But that covenant is good for the descendants of Abraham too. The God of Isaac, which is Abraham's son, and the God of Jacob, which is Isaac's son or Abraham's grandson. And, and then, of course, Joseph, the great grandson. And, and Judah is, is a key player here too. We don't have time to get into him. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. And then we have this conversation with Moses. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Notice the response. The response is purely on the basis of the covenant. Okay. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. His commitment to his covenant is forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And so we know the story. God acts to redeem them, not on the basis, and we'll talk about this in a second, not on the basis of anything Israel had done, but on the basis of his covenant promise to Abraham. Now, as they leave Egypt, they don't leave by the easiest route. And this is kind of a fascinating feature. So this is the traditional route of the Exodus. And you can see they leave if we follow this traditional route. And to be fair, there are lots of different ways of understanding what would have happened exactly. But at least just kind of trying to keep the story of Scripture and take those details seriously, this is something what we would come up with. So they cross the Red Sea, or sometimes known as the Reed Sea, um, probably in a, the shallow northern portion here, or shallower, right? It's not necessarily shallow. It's still an incredible thing, uh, and it's presented as a miracle. But up, up in the upper part here, and um, they come down, instead of going straight across to Canaan, which seems like that would be the easiest way and, of course, would be nearer to the, the, the sea above them, the Mediterranean. Um, instead, they are crossing down to uh, Mount Sinai. And, and with Mount Sinai, they meet the Lord there. That's where they camp and they have this extended period of instruction and, and the Lord being on the mountain and Moses going on the mountain. And then, of course, they're wondering, wandering for 40 years in this desert region, this wilderness region, until they reach um, the promised land of Canaan. And we see, see that response as well, and we'll come to that. But we might wonder, why wouldn't they take the easy way? Why didn't God give the Israelites easy access to the kingdom? And I think the answer is simple. It's to show his miraculous redemption. 
It is a miraculous redemption from a bondage that holds us and keeps us out of the kingdom. That's that's the reality for them, and that's the reality of salvation. So this will be the key event for the people of God to repeat over and over and over again. Remember the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. And so they, they come to Sinai, and really the book of Exodus has two major sections. Uh, the first is the Exodus, the departure uh, from chapters 1 through 15. And you can tell this is the structure because there's this great song in chapter 15, which acts as a transition. And then the second is the Sinai experience where they received the law, and that's uh, 18 and following. Um, and that reception of the law was often referred to as the Mosaic Covenant um, or the Sinai Covenant. So if you hear those terms, they're used synonymously. Now, much confusion surrounds the issue of the law. And this is really what I want to spend just a moment talking about because it is important as we sketch out the story of Scripture. Because Paul, particularly Paul, talks in the New Testament about Christians not being under the law and righteousness being apart from the law. And here I'm thinking of Romans 3, for example. We sometimes dismiss the law entirely. I I've had people say to me, why are you preaching from the Old Testament? <laughs> Which, you know, I covered last week, but it's really a fundamental misunderstanding of what we have in the Old Testament. Some people feel the Old Testament is irrelevant. They they think it may serve as some historical background, but doesn't have really anything to contribute to our life. And to be clear, it's not as though I'm, I'm trying to say that we're bound under the jurisdiction of the law. Yet, the early church didn't dismiss the law. They didn't dismiss the Old Testament. When we read the Old Testament, we must remember that we do so as Christians. Now, let me tell you how a lot of Christians view the law and sort of argue against that for a second. So a lot of people approach this section here in Exodus, and they would think of it this way. And this is wrong, okay? In, in my opinion, this is completely missing the point, and you're bound to misunderstand the arc of Scripture if you miss this. So here's how they think of it. They say, God gave the law for salvation. Okay, that's that's the basic issue. God did not give the law for salvation, but again, this is how they're thinking of it. The people failed. They didn't keep the law. Therefore, God came up with a backup plan, and we see that in Christ. Why do you think we tend to do this? Why do you think we tend to view it this way? Um, I think one of the tendencies to do this is it's a misreading of some of those New Testament passages that seem to be so strongly against the law. But what those passages are after is a perverted use of the law. They're after the notion that the law could somehow save you. Um, they're not really attacking the law as such. So this is not something I want you to read. I, I want you to reject this notion because this is not the way the law is even presented in the Old Testament. Instead, what is it that Abraham did that caused God to give him his attention? What law did Abraham keep to gain God's attention? There's not one, is there? God unilaterally decides to choose Abraham. How about Moses? Moses is just walking in the wilderness and um, is confronted by the burning bush. Why does God lead the Israelites out of Egypt? Well, because of the covenant with Abraham on the basis of his faithfulness. So everything even in the Old Testament, is based on God's free grace. And we could even go further and talk about the role faith plays in all of these Old Testament narratives. We see it clearly in Genesis 15, 6, where it is the faith of Abraham that is credited as righteousness. It's not his action or keeping some laws. Uh, we see it in Genesis 22 as well, when he is willing to sacrifice Isaac. And this is how Paul interprets it in Romans chapter 4. Now, the heart of the law, in, in Exodus, the Mosaic Law, and typically when we're talking about the law, that's what we're referring to, is what we know as the Ten Commandments. And my guess is everybody watching this has some familiarity with the Ten Commandments. Those are in Exodus 20. But do you have any recollection of how those commandments begin? Remember how they begin. God is already their God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So he is already their God. It's not because they keep the law. 
It's not at all. Instead, God acts to redeem them on the basis of his covenant faithfulness. And then they are called as God's people to respond. And the law is the response. Goldsworthy has a quote that summarizes it pretty well. The law is given to the people of God after they become the people of God by grace. At Sinai, God spells out for his people what it means to be the people of God. So we really misunderstand everything when we think that the Ten Commandments or the Old Testament law was equated with salvation. That's not the way the Old Testament presents it. The Old Testament presents a God who acts in free grace to save his people on the basis of his character, his covenant faithfulness, and then the reciprocal response of those people is to be obedient to the God who led them out of Egypt. This is true of the New Testament as well. We always have a hard time trying to balance works and grace, but the New Testament is pretty clear. The people of God should exhibit holiness that is consistent with their calling as the people of God. It is not a way to get into the people of God. It is a way of saying, now that I'm part of the people of God, this is how I live. Let me illustrate this just a little stronger. We sometimes think that if we tell people that God expect what God expects and, and if they do it, everything will be okay. And so you see people post the Ten Commandments, for example, in a public space and say, people just need to keep these. Or, or I've seen signs that say, here's the Ten Commandments. If you died, would you go to heaven or hell? Let me be absolutely clear. There is nothing about salvation that is contingent on our keeping the Ten Commandments because the simple reality is that every single one of us has failed to keep the Ten Commandments. And moreover, the Ten Commandments were never given, never, ever, 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 I can't say it strong enough, never, ever given as a means of salvation. They are always the response to God's grace. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. Now here is how you must live. So the law is a result of being in relationship with God. And the New Testament is abundantly clear about this. Read Romans uh, where Paul says the law is good for exposing sin. The law can condemn us. The law cannot save us. So now does Israel live faithfully as the people of God? The answer, hopefully you already know, is no, they do not live faithfully. Many failures occur, probably the most predominant one being uh, Exodus 32 and the story of the golden calf, um, a really critical text and one that w we do well to reflect on, especially as the American church that gets so bound up in wanting a God that we can see and touch and understand because this calf in all likelihood represents Yahweh. As they lift up this golden calf, they say, behold, the God who brought you out of Egypt. We often do that when we get mixed up in our worship, whether we worship our government or our country or something like that. Or I say that strongly, but I even mean uh, when we start to blend the elements, I think we are crossing into Exodus 32 ground. And I think that's extremely concerning and extremely important for the American church to consider. So in Exodus 32, they are continuing to assert their independence. Um, you know, where is Moses? Where is God? Well, we'll make something we can understand. Then we see it in Numbers, like in Numbers 13 and 14, when they refuse to take possession of the promised land. Instead, they look at it and they say, there are giants there. We can't do it. It's too big for us. We're too afraid. And what that fundamentally is, is a rejection of God's plan, a rejection of God's kingdom structure. So it is effectively a rejection of God's plan to restore the world, right? That, that's the big deal here. It is a rejection of what God is doing in his redemptive action to redeem all things through the promise he made to Abraham. Deuteronomy is uh, another good book to look at here. It functions to reorient Israel, it kind of rehearses the history. It's meaning literally um, in English for us, Deuteronomy. Deutero is second and uh, the uh, nomi ending refers to law. So it's referred to as a second law. Um, it's not that there's additional law per se, uh, but it is a re 
iteration or a uh, recapitulation of the law. And it recounts the story up until that point and really up until the point of Moses' death and then his successor, Joshua, uh, coming on board. And as we move into the book of Joshua, we enter into that period of conquest. And that ends on a good note. Um, pretty good. The, much of the land is conquered. There's some low notes to be sure, but much of the land is conquered. But then we come to Judges, and it shows us another series of cycles of unfaithfulness. Uh, a couple of examples from Judges is, is really enough, and it's this kind of thematic verse. It ends the book, but it appears in several uh, places. We'll come back to it in a minute, but just notice how Judges 2 opens up. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bacham, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. By the way, notice how the angel of the Lord is identified as God who brought them up from Egypt, right? And this is consistent in the Old Testament. This is actually a critical point and just building on the um, Bible study from Sunday morning where John presented a biblical case for the Trinity. This is actually significant because we see these instances where uh, there are figures in the Old Testament that are equated to the Lord or Yahweh in the Old Testament that are authorized to speak on behalf of the Lord. And it's almost like we're seeing this um, uh, functioning of the Trinity within history, uh, what theologians would talk about as the economy of the Trinity, how the Trinity, Trinity functions in time and space and in history. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt. And, and by the way, Jude definitely understands this as Christ and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. There's God's faithfulness again on the basis of that uh, covenant uh, that he gave to their fathers. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So the problem here is that they have failed to take possession of the land. They failed to rid it of these things. And, and the problem is they're rejecting the covenant that the Lord has made with them. So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. So in Judges, we have the cycle of uh, failures. And can you see, even from this opening passage in Judges chapter 2, how all of this is connected to the Exodus, right? Their failure to take up this identity as the people of God. And ultimately, it's a failure for them to stick to the covenant that the Lord had made with them. Um, and we can even ask the question this way, why did God want them to drive out the nations? Because those nations represented a threat to the covenant. Um, and, and the remaining verses in chapter 2 tell us about the book as a whole, these cycles of many salvations where God repeatedly shows his mercy and then the people lapse back into um, idolatry and into failure. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals or, or Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers. Notice there it's connected to the covenant who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, connected to the Exodus. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked Yahweh, the Lord, to anger. And so in Judges, we have these cycles and, and we see this passage at the very end of Judges. That's really the theme verse. And it appears in several other places. You can see the references at the bottom in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So the idea of Judges and where we end in the book of Judges is the covenant that God has made is not being received by the people of Israel. And instead, they are floundering. There's no king in Israel and everyone is doing what is right in his own eyes. It's back to the garden, right, of, of seeking to be their own gods, of not submitting to the Lord's kingship. And that is where we can leave it for this week. So what we have and where we're set up is we're at this point where Israel needs structure.
And though they will continue to rebel, the Lord will, in his good providence, provide that structure. But it will not come in the way they expect. And we already have seen hints of this in the book of Judges. Because in the book of Judges, the tribe of Benjamin is uh, continually rejected. And Judah continually receives this uh, subtle elevation. And what that tells us as we prepare for the next sequences in Israel's history is Saul will be the first king, but he's of the tribe of Benjamin. And it will be actually not the tribe of Benjamin that God brings redemption, but it will be the tribe of Judah. And it will be through David's house, who is a descendant of Judah, who it will be through David's house David's house will be responsible for the eternal heir to the throne, right? We see see that in 2 Samuel 7 in the Davidic covenant, as it's called, that promise to David that one of his descendants will sit on the throne forever and ever. So we can stop our discussion there. Uh, Hopefully this is beneficial so far. Next week, like I said, we'll look at the kingdom history, look at some of the cycles of Uh, failure there and some of the promises that we see, some of the shadows of Christ, Um, but also how that continues to play out this notion of the covenant and the kingdom, right? How God is working in covenant and kingdom. If you have questions or need references for this study, please uh, get in touch with me, contact the church office, go to the about page on our website, um, and you can send me an email under our staff, my email, you can click it and you can find it there. I'll be happy to uh, help you out with that. Uh, But for next week, we will jump into the kingdom and see what God is up to there. For now, let let me pray for you. I know it's virtual, but let me pray for us and pray that God would continue to make himself known to all of us. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so amazed when we consider the sweeping story of scripture. There's truly no other book like it. Um, it's, it. It is self-authenticating because of its beauty and splendor and majesty. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us attentive minds, that you would sink these truths into our hearts. And I pray for each person who has been diligent in watching this, that they would benefit from the knowledge gained. And it wouldn't be mere intellectual knowledge, but it would result in the fruits of obedience, that it would be a great joy to them to learn these truths about you and what you're doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We will see you next week and look out for the sermon on Sunday, the Bible study uh, on Sunday as well. So Bible study at 1015, sermon at 11, or service at 11, and we will be virtual this week. We will see you soon.